This channel is part of the History Hit Network. A hundred and fifty years after they were discovered, the ruins of Angkor remain an enigma. How was this city born? And how did it reach such considerable proportions? Imagine all the cathedrals of France brought together in one vast forest, such as the forest of Fontainebleau. Angkor is something like that. Huge sanctuaries, each built by a sovereign on the site of Angkor, and today invaded by the forest. What was the Angkor Temple's real purpose? A current archaeological dig can now for the first time answer the question. Using new technology, the inside of the royal temple has been resurrected. In order to understand the temples of Angkor, scientists travel back in time and search for forgotten clues among the works of the first explorers. In the cellars of an abbey in the north of France, they have rediscovered an abandoned treasure. It is a testimony of outstanding archaeological value. They are also seeking the heart of the immense city of Angkor, one of the most important cities of its time. An archaeologist reveals the place where it all started. Scientists carry out their investigation among the ruins of the sanctuaries. In doing so, they managed to pierce some of the secrets of the disappeared city. The ancient city of Angkor was abandoned nearly 600 years ago. Tropical forests subsequently devoured what was formerly one of the largest cities in the world, hiding its overall appearance from view. And yet, without an overall view of the city, it's difficult to understand its history, the way in which it developed, and why it gradually occupied such a vast territory. That is why the vestiges of this great civilization, which blossomed between the 8th and the early 15th centuries, continue to raise questions. Yet, with the aid of revolutionary equipment, scientists are today going to see what was until now hidden by the forest. On board this helicopter, a very powerful laser, the LIDAR, will scrutinize the disappeared city with the utmost precision. The LIDAR emits a light beam that pierces the vegetation and hits ground level. The signal it captures can be used to reproduce the imprint of buildings, buildings that no longer exist today. This process reveals the vestiges of the city around the temples. The topography of the heart of Angkor, a surface area of about 200 square kilometers, is shown on a scale of a few centimeters. The LIDAR reveals the foundations of a multitude of wooden constructions, palaces and dwellings that have today totally disappeared. Only the temples built out of stone have survived down the centuries.
The city is organized around three vast reservoirs or barres, the largest of them being an eight by two kilometer rectangle. If you love history, then you will love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. The results of this electronic exploration reveal a vast agglomeration made up of a succession of several towns built around royal temples. Each sovereign had his own sanctuary built. And this is how the Khmer capital of Angkor grew. Why was it that each sovereign had to build his own temple? When you consider the sheer mass of accumulated stones and bricks used to build these large pyramids, it's astonishing to think that each reign imposed the construction of a new sanctuary. Why a new temple for each new reign? And what exactly were the numerous sanctuaries used for? One archaeologist is seeking the answer to these questions about a hundred kilometers from Angkor, in the ancient city of Khor Kher. The city of Khor Kher and its temple form a parenthesis in the history of the Khmer Empire. When the king who had built this new capital died, the city was abandoned and time stood still here forever. French archaeologist Eric Bourdonneau has been studying these ruins for the last four years. Today he can reconstruct the sanctuary and restore its temple mountain, the largest building in the entire history of Angkor. To reach it, one must cross a succession of chapels, the Prasats. What was inside each one of them? And what purpose did they serve? These are the first two questions our researcher must answer. The pyramid reached a height of 30 meters. At its summit was the symbol of the Kokair temple. This empty space is where the king erected the linga of Shiva. The linga is the phallic symbol of Shiva. Imagine a giant cylinder representing the god in the purest, most absolute form. A block over four meters high and over one meter, perhaps almost two meters in diameter. So there really is something unique that was not produced anywhere else in ancient Cambodia. The pyramid and the symbol of Shiva that crowns it is the place of the deity's residence within the sanctuary. In the initial project, the linga was covered by a chapel, but the works were never carried out. And the Kokair site was returned to the forest just 20 years after it was built. In the 1990s, the temple, which had remained intact until then, was methodically pillaged by traffickers. All the existing statues disappeared. And yet, in order to properly understand the sanctuary, each statue must be identified. The aim of Eric Bourdonneau's investigation is precisely to carry out such an identification, starting with this chapel in which five statues were found. One of the statues was exceptionally large. We found this statue that was originally over three meters, nearly four meters high, in several thousand pieces. The pieces were scattered all around the pedestal. Here we have the fragments of Shiva's arms. Here, a little to the left, the bust. And all around the pedestal we found legs, feet, fragments of hands and heads. These are now kept in the museum of Phnom Penh. So today we have a gigantic puzzle that needs piecing together. 
To carry out this difficult operation, Eric is supported by Shea Sociat, a restorer of statues at the Museum of Phnom Penh. This year we're removing the largest blocks, so it's a rather tricky operation, with the arms of the dancing Shiva and the pedestals of the deities that were arranged around the dancing Shiva. The team begin their work with the pedestal of one of the four statues that formerly surrounded Shiva. A statue that is currently at the Musée Guimet in Paris. It is one of the two sculptures from Coquer. The second will soon be of critical importance in Eric Bourdonneau's investigation into the Khmer temples. Two masterpieces brought back to France in 1873 by one of the discoverers of Angkor, Louis de la Porte. De la Porte also carried out numerous drawings of the Khmer temples. Today, these drawings have become very precious documents for the archaeologists. It's the statue of the goddess, the wife of Shiva. Her role was to accompany Shiva's dance, so the goddess danced at the same time as Shiva. Each fragment is moved, stage by stage, by hoisting them. The same method used in ancient Cambodia. Currently, the team is extracting the bust of the huge statue of Shiva from the chapel. Today, it is unrecognizable. Here you can clearly see the traces of the chisels used to pillage them. All this side here has been massacred, so to speak, in an attempt to recover the heads at the top of the bust. As we found it in a thousand pieces, I think it's a lot more probable the pillagers use chisels rather than dynamite. When villagers see a statue that's been broken, they tend to think it's been done by dynamite. Here you can really see the marks of a chisel, which explains the small strips, the thousands of small strips we found. These are the right arms of Shiva that we have just brought out. You can recognize the shoulder easily here. 60 centimeters deep. That gives another good idea of the colossal size of the statue. Five arms, the inner arms. And for each arm, there were the forearms that held attributes. So one hand holds, for example, the top of a skull. Another holds a trident, Shiva's attribute par excellence. Another hand holds a club. So globally, these are attributes that are associated with the warrior-like nature of this dance. We're going to bring back all the blocks from the Prasat Kroam to the Museum of Siem Reap. Then we'll scan them, and from these scans, we'll carry out a virtual reconstruction of this set of sculptures. But in addition to the reconstruction of the set of sculptures, our aim is, of course, to piece together the history of this temple, the history of the practices that went on at this temple, to understand why the 10th century sovereign who reigned in Kokea created his capital at Kokea, why he built this temple and why he erected these statues. The following day, the archaeological treasure is taken to the Norodom Sihanouk Museum, located close to the temples of Angkor. 
All the remains that were discovered during the dig at the chapel of Shiva have now been gathered together there. At the museum, a team consisting of scientists from the universities of Heidelberg and Phnom Penh will digitalize the largest fragments. We have collected about 10,000 pieces in total. Of these 10,000, 1,000 are in recognizable shapes. And out of that 1,000, we have selected 100 that are particularly significant. We will use these 100 pieces, or just over 100, to reconstruct Shiva. And this virtual reconstruction will be an extremely precious tool for the real-life restoration that, I hope, will be carried out in the future. The operation lasts five weeks during which the fragments of the statue are transformed into digital fragments. Then we head for Heidelberg. It's here that Shiva is to regain his original shape. Heidelberg boasts one of Germany's leading universities and includes a department dedicated to the application of mathematics to archaeology. To be really sure that two pieces go well together, we switch to high definition, and we try to align the fragments in such a way that the match is immediately detected in mathematical terms. In this case, the two pieces are very clearly compatible. Shiva had ten hands, five heads and two hands for each head. We've only found six hands, so we're trying to put those in place. And once we've done that, we can start to think about where the other hands went and what attributes they were holding. I think here we probably the trace of, an, of the, ah, so the mace, the club, down, yes, going down to... As an attribute to yeah. On each knee, slightly behind the knee, you can see a vertical line where something has been ripped off. That means it was an attribute there, probably a club or a sword of Shiva's, which ran down from one of the upper arms, alongside the knee, and then joined the pedestal. It would also have served to support the statue, making it more robust. This is where I can really take stock of how huge the statue was and how impressive it must have looked to visitors that entered the temple. You've got the contrast with the two statues of the female deities, who were sculpted on a human scale. But the central deity is double that size, if not more. This statue, with its colossal size and in this dancing position, is something unique in the archaeology of ancient Cambodia. Finally reconstructed, this is the most extraordinary statue in the entire history of Angkor. 5.6 meters high with its 10 arms and 5 faces, it was very probably painted red, which would have given it an even more impressive appearance. Around Shiva in the chapel are Uma, his benevolent wife, two drummers, and Kali, the deity's fearsome wife, holding a human skull and leg. The entry chapel to the temple was a sort of antechamber to the afterlife. But what happened beyond this terrifying door? The archaeologists will now investigate the next chapel, which must be crossed in order to proceed to the central sanctuary. 
With his team, he has cleared the pedestals of the eight statues that were located there. These statues must now be identified in order to understand what scenes they represented. All the statues that were located here have been totally pillaged. The statues were smashed so they could be carried away. The pedestals were overturned, and only a fraction of the original sculptures remain. The archaeologists are familiar with four out of the eight statues. At the Museum of Phnom Penh, the body of a hunchback from the chapel is on display. There are also two sculpted heads, but for now, there are no clues as to their identity. This second chapel is therefore an enigma. And it would remain an enigma forever if French explorer Louis de la Porte had not visited Coquer and immortalized the statues before they disappeared. Delaporte's drawings are extremely interesting. At first, they may look a little awkward, but they provide us with a view of the site as it was discovered when he arrived in 1885. The statues were still erect. They were emerging from the archaeological layers, and everything is in place. Nothing has been knocked over. A few heads are missing, but that's all. Everything is there. But one particular statue does raise questions. A headless figure is mounted on an animal. Up until now, archaeologists believed this animal to be a bull, Shiva's mount. Eric is about to prove them wrong. During the dig at the chapel, he discovers a fragment that he immediately links to the animal's head. You can clearly see the trace of the horns, and these horns protrude horizontally on the sides. So they are buffalo horns, not bull's horns. We found a second fragment of these horns, which would probably have been located here, and which gives us an idea of the scale of the buffalo's horns. So if it is indeed a buffalo and not a bull, the deity that was sitting on it was not Shiva, but Yama. Yama was the judge of the dead and the king of hell. That totally changes the interpretation of the set of sculptures. What was erected here was a scene of the judgment of the dead. So the fearsome Yama was present in the heart of the temple of Koker. But why? Who was he there to judge? Eric and Pierre Baptiste, head curator at the Musée Guimet in Paris, immediately thought of a statue brought back by Louis de la Porte, another statue from the same chapel. It is referred to as male deity. But now the two scientists are not so sure. What if the statue actually represented a human being? In this example, it's got more natural locks of hair in a way. The answer can be found in the statue's hair. The band bordering the hair is rather standard. The Khmers represented their deity's hair differently from that of humans. It's more visible around the other side. The braids pass underneath the diadem. The statue's costume is a classic one for the period. The figure is erected on a pedestal and has a very ornate diadem, like all deities, that's true. But when you take a closer look at the hair, there could be an ambiguity there we hadn't necessarily noted before. As a reference, Pierre is using three heads of deities brought back to Paris by Louis de la Porte. They have very specific hairstyles. Here we have a cylinder, which evokes the bun on top of the head, but which is styled in a cylinder to which wide braids are attached, long plaits that cascade downwards. In Khmer art, which is highly codified, deities must always be represented in the same way, whereas the convention for representing humans is very different. Eric and Pierre examine the sculpted head of Jayavarman VII, the great 12th century sovereign. His hairstyle is more naturalistic, 
The plats mounted into a bun are clearly visible. This resembles what they have observed on the head of the male deity. So the statue could indeed therefore represent a human. But if so, who? Eric Bourdonneau draws a parallel with a stell from the temple of Vatpu, and which may depict a similar scene to the one at the temple of Coquer. This is a royal figure with his diadem. His arms are stretched out in front of him, holding a manuscript. And very probably in the manuscript he is holding are his great deeds as a sovereign. He is presenting it to Yama, the judge of the dead, who is holding a club and who is sitting on what is clearly a buffalo. Squatting behind him is a small figure with his hands tied behind its back. This small character is the object of a sacrifice. The sacrifice is carried out by Yama's assistant, who is here, holding a sword firmly in his right hand, a flat sword that will be used to decapitate the prisoner. An important step has been taken in Eric Bourdonneau's investigation. This statue is not a deity, but very probably a representation of the king that built the temple of Coquer, Jaya Varman IV. That leaves the six other statues that were located in the chapel. Eric Bourdonneau consults the photographs of them taken at the site in the 1930s. Now that he knows what the scene represented, the king's judgment, it is easier to identify them. The hunchback is probably Yama's chief assistant. Here his hands are joined, but in later examples, he is holding a scales to measure and weigh the qualities and faults of the deceased who is being subjected to Yama's judgment. Chitragupta is the scribe. He noted down in his records all acts, good and bad. This is Dharma, who must have been holding a stick, and who applied the sentences that were pronounced by Yama. This is the sun and the moon, which are easily identifiable from the sort of halo around the figures. As the inscriptions say, Yama's judgment is valid for as long as the sun and the moon will last. Back in Coquer, it's just a matter of putting the right statue on the right pedestal. Once again, Louis de la Porte is of great help to the scientist. Using this simple sketch, he can reconstruct the missing scene. On Yama's left, the hunchback, his chief assistant. Chitragupta, Yama's scribe. The sun on the left, the moon here. The Musée Guimet statue, the statue of the king, turned towards Yama, the judge of the dead. Up until now, the archaeologists thought that this chapel was dedicated to Shiva. Eric demonstrates that, on the contrary, it houses the face-to-face -face confrontation of two major characters. The sovereign, who presents the great book of his reign, and Yama, the god of hell. There is little doubt that the king passed the test successfully. In doing so, he symbolically crossed the threshold of the afterlife and came back deeply transformed. This judgment of the dead changes everything, or many things at any rate, regarding our understanding of the Khmer temple. We previously thought that it was simply the deity's residence. Today we have discovered that on his journey to the center of the sanctuary, the center of the Khmer temple, the devotee passed before Yama's judgment, so he experienced a death, perhaps a ritual one, in order to be better reborn in the deity's residence. That's a totally new perception of the Khmer temple. But that is not all. On careful examination of the chapel floor, Eric notices some notches. What could they have been used for? There are three grooves radiating from Yama's pedestal. 
Here is one of the four holes around the central space. Holes cut into the stone for pillars. These lead Eric to think of a ceremonial area, and he imagines a canopy in the center of the chapel. He then makes an association with the Vatpu stele on which a man was sacrificed to the deity Yama. He surmises that the ceremony must have taken place under this canopy. We could think that this very specific setup is linked to a ritual staging during which the king sacrificed a man. As we see on the stele of Vatpu, a man was decapitated on behalf of the king. He died for the king. This chapel was the missing link for understanding the whole of the building. Eric Bourdonneau can now reconstitute the path that leads from the door of the temple to the heart of the sanctuary. First, there is the encounter with the fearsome Shiva, the all-knowing and destructive deity creator. Then, after crossing the moats, the devotee was presented to Yama, the king of hell. And it is only once they had crossed the threshold of this room, in other words, once they had penetrated into the domain of death, that they could gain access to the central sanctuary. A very small room for a very small sized linger. The most concentrated, most powerful form of the deity Shiva. Shiva who also resides at the summit of his pyramid. But this commanding stone building does not mark the end of the journey. Behind the mountain temple of Kokea is a hill about 15 meters high. On the very flat plain of the region of Angkor, this hill is an abnormality and therefore interests the archaeologist. We carried out digs and soundings inside this hill, which showed the existence of a 15-meter layer of ash and charcoal. That could indicate charcoal from a vast funerary pyre, and this factor is of key importance, as it ties in well with the funerary aspect that we have proven in parallel via our research with the group of statues. Villagers recount that this hill is the tomb of the white elephant, Several altars, such as this one, are dedicated to him. The elephant is a royal symbol for Cambodians. Memories of this pyre have been passed down through history, a further clue confirming that Kokea was indeed formerly a funerary temple. But were the other sanctuaries of Angkor also funerary temples? The question is of prime importance, because if they were, that would explain why each sovereign had to build his own temple. So is this true of Angkor Wat, the most prestigious of all the Khmer temples? In the 12th century, at the time it was built, Khmer artists excelled in bas reliefs. The deity Yama, king of hell, was represented in these bas reliefs and no longer in the form of a statue. Unfortunately, the rest of the scene is in pieces. How can one travel back in time? Is it possible to see the reliefs of Angkor as the first explorers saw them nearly 150 years ago? The answer lies in the north of France. The cellars of the abbey in the village of Saint-Riquier conceal a veritable archaeological treasure. Hundreds of casts of the temples of Angkor, made in the late 19th century under Louis de la Porte's direction.
Louis de la Porte had a certain number of these lintels molded with very beautiful raised decorations on them. The real lintels have since been greatly damaged by the rain and the sun, which have worn away the sandstone. So this quality of surface is over a century old. Today, when you visit the site, you can no longer see all this ornamentation or the different figures that make up these vast friezes. The interesting thing about these molds is that they have fixed in time a particular condition of the surfaces that no longer exists today. The molds give us information that we had lost since the end of the 19th century. These casts, which bear witness to the discovery of the temples of Angkor, are today of great benefit to scientists. With these casts, the researchers have a three-dimensional print of the reliefs that have since been damaged or even disappeared completely for some of them. They constitute traces of Khmer monuments before the ravages of time changed them forever. However, before they can be studied, they must be saved from the abbey's cellars. This is a highly complex stage and will take several weeks. The problem here in Saint-Riquier is that some of the casts measure up to 500 cubic meters and haven't been moved since the 1970s. Today, when we move the casts, the straw and the brown paper around them, which is in very bad condition, create a sort of cloud of fungus spores, aspergillus. So out of precaution, given that we'll be working here for six weeks, we need all this airtight equipment. A tent has been erected in the gardens of the abbey, in which the restorers clean and consolidate the casts before they're transported. Each one of these fragments belongs to a larger ensemble, the imprint of part of an Angkor temple. Louis de la Porte, who funded several expeditions to Cambodia in order to make the casts, wanted to show members of the public the monuments in their original scale. You have to imagine in the forest the people who discovered these unknown sculptures. They had to make casts in very difficult conditions. They had to make imprints. They had to make plaster casts on site, then put them all into a crate, transport them on carts pulled by buffalo or on rafts during the rainy season, then take them all to Saigon, and then travel all the way to Paris by boat arriving via the Seine on a barge. The whole human adventure fascinates me of the discovery or rediscovery of the temples of Angkor and the rather wild desire to exhibit them almost on a life-size scale in a museum in Paris. At the time the casts were made, the temples were buried under the tropical forest. The stone and the reliefs were covered in vegetation which protected them from the harshness of the climate. This explains why the sculptures that were reproduced were perfectly intact. Close to the condition they were in in the early 15th century, when the city was abandoned. Given their excellent condition, once they've been restored, certain pieces will be scanned. and the digitalized casts will then in turn be compared to the reliefs of the Angkor temples. <laughs> to what extent have the sculptures been damaged over the last 150 years? And what will these casts be able to tell us about what the Khmer temples were used for? Pierre Baptiste and Dominique Neusser from the University of Heidelberg start their work by the western wall of the temple. The feet of this deva have already been affected by erosion, as have many sculptures of this early 12th century temple, whose stone is gradually crumbling away. This is a very characteristic sound. It sounds hollow. You can tell the upper layer of stone has risen. 
We say it is flaked. It has become detached from the structure of the stone. This whole block could come away just by prizing it off, by lifting it slightly. It falls away exactly like a layer of onion coming off. Dominique Neusser takes several dozen photographs of the goddess from all angles. These photographs will be used to produce a digital cast of the sculpture. The same process is carried out on Louis de la Porte's plaster cast of the gate, taken 150 years ago of the same goddess. The two digital imprints can then be compared. The same process is then used for the second gallery of the temple, whose inside wall is covered in reliefs. This gallery contains the most beautiful sculptures, sculptures that also provide the most precious information for the scientists. Here, unfortunately, the deteriorations are even more serious. The bas-relief of the temple on the top is markedly more damaged than its cast, carried out in the late 19th century. But that is nothing compared to the famous Heaven and Hell Gallery, which was severely mutilated in 1947. All this part of the southern gallery, the eastern half, collapsed onto itself. The blocks fell forwards, and all the pillars collapsed on the outside of the temple, so all this part suffered extensive damage. That is why it is now very difficult to interpret all these episodes. A reading of the lower part is still possible. You can see hell, but the upper part is more difficult, as all the heavens have disappeared. We still have the princess, who is in the center in her palace, and all her followers, who are exactly on the line that was broken when it collapsed. So we lost all their faces. All the intricacies of their costumes, their hands, and their jewelry have been preserved. We've still got the trimmings and their tiaras, but the central part is missing. We no longer have their expressions. And we only have these expressions in Paris, in storage at the Musée Guimet. This gallery is of prime importance in the investigation into the Angkor temples. It recounts the life of the Khmers after their judgment by Yama, Lord of Hell. What role did the deity play in this sanctuary? The answer can be found in this warehouse in the south of Paris, where Louis de la Porte's molds have been transported. Here we have 2,500 square meters of warehouse in which we have brought together all the collections of the Indo-Chinese Museum of Trocadero. A sort of puzzle placed in one huge box with 1,200 pieces to put together, fragments of the temples of Angkor and other monuments of Southeast Asia. For several weeks, Hundreds of casts that have been removed from the cellars of the abbey at Saint-Riquier are being restored and recomposed. When the task is finally finished, they will reveal all their secrets. The result is particularly spectacular for the Gallery of Heaven and Hell, which was intact in the 1880s when the cast was made. The cast is scanned by the team at the University of Heidelberg. The digital mold will then be compared to the recomposed fragments of the gallery in Cambodia. It is no longer just the sovereign, but the entire court presenting themselves before the king of hell. The funerary role of the Angkor Wat temple is therefore key, as are, by extension, very probably the roles of all the city's royal sanctuaries. 
After their death, sovereigns were either buried, or at the very least, their ashes were probably placed in the sanctuary, and very probably these monuments played a specifically funerary role, which meant that logically, the successor had to build a new temple mountain, a new temple state, to protect the kingdom during his lifetime, and, above all, to prepare his future in the afterlife. This would also explain the geography of Angkor. Given that each sovereign had to found his own temple, the sanctuaries were added on to each other over the centuries. But did this city in perpetual development have a center? The investigation turns to the only fortified city of the Angkor agglomeration, Angkor Thom, the large town in Khmer. Its walls date back to the late 12th century, but the city it protects could be a great deal older. The king who had these walls built, the last great sovereign of Angkor, was called Jayavarman VII. He also built the temple of Bayonne, with its famous towers featuring faces. The sanctuary is located at the heart of Angkor Thom, a fortified square with sides of three kilometers, inside which there were further walls, those of the royal palace. French archaeologist Jacques Gaucher has just made an important discovery there. He has discovered not a sculpture, nor an inscription, but a tree trunk. He keeps a sample of it in this crate filled with damp sand to better conserve the wood. Its scientific name is Paranari anamensis. In Khmer, it is a well-known tree, a tlok. The tlok is a sacred tree in ancient Cambodian legends. It is associated with the myth of the founding of the city, hence the importance of this discovery. Jacques Gaucher has taken this sample of the tree trunk to carry out analysis. The results show that the wood dates back to the 9th century, which corresponds to the origins of Angkor. At the same place the tree was found, he has also found the remains of a palace, and this is one of its columns. This morning, he is bringing these archaeological vestiges back to the very place they were discovered. He passes through the gate to Angkor Thom and heads for the royal palace where the dig took place. This is the palace of the kings of Angkor Thom. It is a large rectangle measuring 600 by 200 meters. And in the center of this palace, there is what we call a temple mountain, a tiered pyramid which has three tiers made out of laterite and which is situated at the heart of the palace. It is here, at the northwest corner of the pyramid, that Jacques Gaucher and his team carried out their research. Although the temple of Pimeanakas was built in the 11th century, the scientists have found much older elements. At a depth of four meters, they first exhumed the vestiges of the first royal palace. And then, less than a meter under these pieces of wood, they found the famous tree trunk. It was found in a hollow, as though it had been buried like a precious object. It may not seem very significant, but for Jacques Gaucher, it is a critical piece of information, because it links into a legend that has been recounted in Angkor since time immemorial. 
The legend recounts that an Indian prince, Priyach Tong, who had come from India, or from a foreign land in any case, married a local princess who was a Naguini, in other words, a serpent woman, the daughter of the king of serpents. The king of serpents, the king of the Naguas, was sovereign of the land. And in this capacity, he was also sovereign of the waters. This was very important in the Khmer world, where people always lived with the annual threat of too much water, from which they had to protect themselves, or of not enough water, which they needed. This serpent Nagawa was master of the earth, master of the underworld, and master of the waters. The union took place around a tree, which is called a tlok. So here we have a scenario in which the archaeological layers tie in with a founding myth. The link is this tree, the tlok. This founding myth of the city matches the Khmer obsession with flooding and with all creatures of the earth when the plain of Angkor is submerged during the rainy season. These sea creatures are represented on the sides of this large basin, which neighbors the pyramid. The myth of the Tlok has remained alive throughout the history of Angkor. In the 13th century, a Chinese diplomat who was staying in the Khmer capital recounted the tale its inhabitants had told him. Every night, the king had to rise to the summit of Pimianakis, where he met a spirit in the form of a nine-headed snake. When the snake took on the form of a woman, he made love to her. This mystic union took place on a daily basis and was imperative for the stability of the kingdom. In the event that the nine-headed snake did not appear, the life of the king, and of course the future of the kingdom, would be threatened. At the very place where the Tlok tree was buried, the mythical tree of the founding of Angkor, was the center of gravity of the entire agglomeration, and by extension, the whole empire. With this discovery, Jacques Gaucher has found the first of the secrets of Angkor. Every night, during a ritual, the Khmer kingdom underwent regeneration at the summit of the pyramid. And the process persisted for more than 500 years. Thank you.